into Luke chapter 9, uh, which seems like the eternal chapter, doesn't it? Um, my wife said that. She's like, still Luke 9? I said, we'll be there in a few, for a few months. So uh, let's pray. One of the things that we have not maybe done during these past several months uh, is, is praying more. Praying more as individuals, praying more as a, as a community. And uh, we're going to talk about prayer in the message. But I think it would be good just to, I'm going to just ask a few of our, our leaders just to pray for certain topics and, and, and certain contexts for us because we're all feeling different things right now. We're all experiencing different things. And um, I think it's great to know that we have a God who hears us. Isn't that awesome? And he cares for us. And um, one of the things the finance team and, and, and I met yesterday Day, which I know it doesn't sound like a great meeting, right? The finance, but it's, it's a party. We have a good time. We're a lot of laughing, a lot of smiling. God is good, but we're talking about people that are out of work, people who have lost their jobs, people who have been furloughed, people who have taken a, a financial hit during these past few months, and uh, we want you to know that we're a church that's walking with you and journeying alongside of you, and, and we want to be sensitive to those things. So if there's a need that you might have, please, please let us know. But I'm going to ask my, uh, my brother Brian to, to just pray for those of us that are here that are dealing with some maybe some financial difficulties, some job difficulties. Um, I know my buddy Brian has, has experienced this himself, so he, uh, he knows what that, that feels like. But um, we want to call out to God and pray for those that are just experiencing some difficulties in the, uh, in the employment area. So Brian, join in your hearts with what Brian is praying. We're just agreeing with him. We're coming before God. So Brian, if you would, sure. pray for us if you would. Heavenly Father, we just come before you because these are unusual times. Uh, we're faced with this pandemic. We're faced with uncertainty, uh, more so than we typically would be in our lives. And we just come to you and we just pray that uh, we find our strength through your Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And um, this world can be paralyzing. Um, having losing a, losing a job can um, take away uh, our, our strength, our framework of what we believe our life should be. Mm. Um, things can start to crumble in our minds, and um, we need you to help us to shore that up. Mm. We need to find our strength in you. And um, as your word says, we should be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and supplication and just give you the thanksgiving for all the blessings. Just mm. let our requests be known to you, Lord. Um, let us fall at your feet. Um, know that you are Abba Father. And um, there's cases where, and I can testify to this, that you think all is broken, and uh, suddenly a few years later you look back and you're like, life has never been better. And uh, it gives mm. us a time to reflect mm. on our relationship with you. Um, maybe you're trying to get our attention. Maybe you're trying to bring us back to you, to so draw us near to you. Mm. And I uh, just pray for my brothers and sisters out there that are experiencing this to know that it's just a season. Uh, be faithful. Lord, may you open up new doors, new opportunities, and uh, provide strength for the families that are going through this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. I know also we're experiencing um, different uh, health situations. I know those are, there might be people here who are dealing with some different health issues. Uh, we definitely have people in our lives that are def dealing with some health issues, and we want to be able to call upon God with those things too. And so I'm going to ask uh, Ann Sturber, if you would, pray for those that might be having a difficult time right now physically, different health things, trusting God um, for healing. Would you mind leading us in prayer in that? Thanks, Ann. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, you are holy, 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 and we are not. Mm. But you have given us the privilege to come before your throne of grace, Lord. Mm. And we know that you are eternal and your word is eternal, so we can trust you in all things, Lord. Mm. And you are also the great physician and that you can uh, heal us or you can hold our hand and walk us through it, Lord. Mm. That you are there for us in every need that we have. Mm -hmm. And most especially when we are not feeling well or there's some health things that are just severe, Lord, that you can lift us up and you can walk us through it. Mm -hmm. And so, Lord, I ask that you continue to um, heal us and make us whole, mm. most especially make us whole in you, Lord. Yeah. And may we trust your faithfulness. You are the very definition of faithful, Lord. And so, uh, Lord, I ask that um, each person in this uh, room that is suffering any kind of uh, physical problem, Lord, that you know exactly what it is and that they can trust in you in the walk. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. I know one of the areas that maybe we have a hard time praying for our, our, uh, our leaders, 
our government, our president, our representatives. Uh, some of you are like, do I have to? Yes, you have to. Uh, you're, you're called by God to do this. And uh, if I could ask, uh, Hannah, can I call on you to, to pray for, uh, for just our, who wants to be in their shoes right now? Just raise your hands, right? Like no one wants that job. And yet we have appointed them. Um, we know that there's a sovereign God behind everything. And just sometimes it's hard, but we need to pray for them. We need to pray for them in wisdom and to guide uh, not only our nation, but even world leaders too, as we're all going through difficult thing times right now. So Hannah, if you could pray for that. Yeah, absolutely. Lord God, we come before you. We just thank you so much that we can be here together worshiping you. Lord, we thank you for this country that we live in and the freedom that it provides. And Lord, for the world in general that you have created, what a beautiful, beautiful world. And Lord, mm. we know that the leaders that are in place um, have struggles, have issues of their own. Um, but Lord, you have allowed them to be in their position for a reason that is bigger than we may be able to understand. But God, we trust you and we mm. know that you are sovereign. We know that you're in control. And we just pray for the leaders, God, that you would just somehow focus their mind to you, God, for those who don't know you, that they would see you in the midst of their trials and their struggles that they deal with, God, and that mm -hmm. you would bring people into their lives to minister and to speak the truth. And Lord, mm -hmm. for those who do know you or uh, whether they don't or do lord that they would just they would come to know you that you would be glorified and lord that that would manifest in their actions their decisions their appointments their talk mm -hmm. their speech god we just want your name to be glorified and we pray mm -hmm. for all of us in the meanwhile um, that we would not put our faith <clears throat> and hope in politics or government but lord mm -hmm. to keep our eyes focused on yeah. you to do what we can to help those around us that are really struggling mm -hmm. um and also to just just constantly point people to the joy and peace that is found only in a relationship with you. And we just thank you so much again for your sovereignty, your control. Mm -hmm. Forgive us, Lord, our waywardness and our struggles. And we thank you that you're right there to help us back up. We mm -hmm. love you, Lord, in your name. Amen. 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 Um, I'm going to ask my wife. Uh, you might know her as the marvelous Miss Morgan. Um, um, this is a time, and I know we've had time to interact with people who are just really wrestling, wrestling with God, wrestling with faith, wrestling in relationships. Boy, I tell you what, you know, quarantine and lockdown sometimes brings out the best, sometimes it brings out the worst in, in marriages, uh, parent-child relationships, just friendships. Um, we're praying that um, there's, a, there's a spirit of forgiveness that would work and a spirit of healing. So I'm going to ask Lori to pray for that. Father God, we know that you are the creator and sustainer of relationships, whether we are single or married, um, we, whether we are younger or older, God, you put people into our lives um, because in relationship we can reflect the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And we just want to um, bring to mind those people that we are maybe struggling with, where there's conflict, where there's discord, where there's disunity. Father, help us to be brave enough to um, go the distance and do the work that we need to do to have healthy relationships. Mm. Um, God, some of us are struggling with loneliness because we desire relationship. Mm. I pray that you would fill that void and be our all in all when we are alone or lonely. Mm. And for those of us who are in a marriage relationship where it's just battle after battle, I pray, God, that these um, men and these women would just humble themselves and speak out and ask for help because we're here to come alongside anybody who is struggling yeah. um, with just imbalance mm. and um, all kinds of emotions. So help us to, to truly be the body of Christ, and that is that the head would be nothing without the neck and the arms without the fingers and the toes without the feet, and we are all connected and when we are healthy, we can run a marathon. And so thank you, God, for being that for us, helping us, giving us the tools we need to have healthy relationships and help us to be a forgiving people. Mm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Uh, lastly, let's pray just, um, here's one, one of the big prayers I pray for you as a, as a church and myself, that we're just a good witness to the world. We're, we're, we're a positive presence. Um, we have a responsibility to, to shine as lights in a, in, a, in a dark culture. So I'm going to ask Ryan. Ryan, could you pray just as far as our position, our posture, and our, our, our temperament, attitude in the world, that it would be Christ-honoring? Yeah. Thanks. 
Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning just with an eager heart, Lord, to, to uh, reflect the love of Christ to this world, Lord, that's going through such, such a difficult season right now, Lord. There's so much despair, so much frustration, uncertainty, anxiety, uh, Lord. It can be a daunting season right now, Lord. I just pray that your Holy Spirit will just strengthen us, Lord, that it'll strengthen our hearts and draw us closer to your word where mm -hmm. we find comfort and hope. Lord, I, I, I am one to believe where this is an exciting time for the church. I think this mm -hmm. is a moment where the church is going to be refined. Mm -hmm. In Romans 1 through 5, it says that when the church perseveres, it develops character the character of Christ and where there's the character of Christ, there's hope, mm -hmm. hope where we can look to, but also hope for the rest of the world. When they see us, Lord, when, mm -hmm. when they see the body of Christ respond to such difficulty and, and, and uncertainty with, mm -hmm. with rejoice, with rejoicing hearts, Lord. I pray that uh, the world will just come to know your love, come to know the security and the forgiveness and the grace that comes through a relationship with your son, Jesus. Mm. Thankful for you, Lord. Thankful for your constant and faithful presence. Thankful for the body of Christ who stands on a, on a hill like a light to this rest of the world, Lord. Mm. Thank you. And all that you are, we glorify and exemplify your name. Amen. 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 Let's continue to pray for one another. And if there's anything specific, please let us know what we can be praying for. All right, church. Luke 9, turn your Bibles there if you would. We're going to dive into um, a great, great section of scripture. Uh, then again, aren't they great, right? Aren't they all great? So uh, picture first, 500 years ago, a painter by the name of Raphael, no, not one of the Ninja Turtles, somebody else, painted this picture called the Transfiguration. Now, if you remember the Transfiguration from last week, that was the moment Jesus took three disciples, Peter, James, John, on top of a mountain, showed forth his, his majestic glory, was accompanied by uh, uh, Moses and Elijah. And so you see Raphael's painting here, top portion we could call majesty, right? There's the scene we looked at last week. You got Jesus in the center. Doesn't he look amazing, stellar, so accessorized? Ama Moses, Elijah at the side. And then sleeping right below him are Peter, James, and John. And then they're woken from their sleep, right? So the top part of the painting that we would call majesty, write that word down in your notes, majesty. Now, what I love about Raphael's painting is that he gives us the full picture because there's a bottom portion that I'm going to call messy. Write down that word messy. And you're thinking to yourself, how could those two ideas coexist at the same time and same place? Well, they do because this is the amazing truth about the majesty of, of Jesus. It not only exists in those realms we would designate majestic, but how does the majesty of Jesus exists in the messiness of the world down below. So you notice the world down below, which is the world we're going to look at this morning, is a world full of finger pointing, a world full of accusing, a world full of judging. Notice on the far right side of the picture, there's a father who's holding his son who has been going through epileptic seizures ever since the day he was born. He's been possessed by demons. He has been destroyed day in and day out by some sort of oppressive force. The father is trying to get his his son to Jesus because he has yet to find anyone that could heal his child's malady. You have scribes, religious leaders. You have the other nine disciples who didn't go to the top of the mountain. And what we're going to call this whole scene down below is messy. How many of you can relate with messy, uh, messy world? How many of you cannot relate with how the majesty of Christ interacts or intersects with our messy world? We're confused at this. Yet Raphael combines these two images because what we need to see is not that just the majesty of Christ exists in heaven, but the majesty of Christ can exist in our worlds, in our lives, here and now. What does that look like? How does this take place? That's the topic we're going to deal with this morning. So turn in Luke 9. What you're going to see is that Luke takes us from the Mount of Transfiguration right back down into the valley of the troubles of everyday life. Can someone say troubles? You're feeling it, aren't you? 
right? What we have to realize, what we have to acknowledge is that we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is surrounded by men and women who do not believe, who do not have faith. And when you live in a context like that, you have to realize life will be full of troubles. But yet, how does the majesty of Christ interact with a world that is messy? Here's the good news. Jesus doesn't just exist in the majestic realm. He can also bring his majesty to come to bear in the messiness of our world. And the only way we can understand the majesty of Christ in our troubles, the only way we can even see the majesty of Christ within our difficulties is one word. You ready for this? The one word, belief. Belief is the connection between what we're going through and having an eye towards something hope-filled, something better, something that we can long for and expect that's gonna be, that we can be optimistic about, right? The only way you can see the majesty of Christ in the messiness of your lives is through one word, belief. But I wish it was as simple as me just saying, just believe. I wish I was Tom Hanks walking down the Polar Express and gave you that ticket that says, believe. But it's so much more complicated than that. How many of you would say belief is complicated? And we wish we could just leave it to an animated feature film that we watch at Christmas time and be like, just believe. it's not as easy as that. So today, what we're going to look at is the topic of belief. And by looking at belief, we also have to look at unbelief. Because sometimes I think we're practitioners of unbelief better than we're practitioners of belief. Can I get an amen from somebody? So here we go. Luke chapter 9, we have the scene that the focus is going to be on belief. And belief is that vital, that real connection we have to Jesus, with Jesus, that is so critical for daily living. Luke chapter 9, starting at verse 37. So Jesus and three disciples have come down from the mountain, verse 37, came about on the next day when they had come down from the mountain, a great multitude met Jesus. Jesus can't get a day off. He's constantly met by a barrage of people wherever he goes. And behold, there was a man in that crowd, in that multitude, who shouted out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only boy. And behold, there's a spirit that seizes him, and he suddenly screams and throws him out into convulsion with foaming at the mouth, and it mauls him, and it scares him scarcely leaves him. My son literally is being destroyed by this demon, this oppression daily. And I begged your disciples, verse 40, to cast out and they could not. And Jesus answered and said, O unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Well, that's kind of unloving, isn't it? How many of you have ever heard Jesus say to you, how long shall I put up with you? He says, bring your son here. And while he was still approaching, the demon dashed him to the ground and threw him into convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to the father. And they were all amazed at the greatness or majesty of God. But while everyone was marveling at that, Christ leans over to his disciples, verse 44, and says, let these words sink into your ears for the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement and it was concealed from them so that they may not perceive it and they were afraid to ask him about this statement. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. Interesting scene. Interesting phrase from Jesus, huh? In verse 41. I've come across a number of men and women who have kind of come to this portion of scripture and just said, we're just going to go ahead and skip this. Because it's hard for us to reconcile a a severe statement that Jesus makes and and to try to wrap our minds around it. But I I think we need to press through it. We need to press through it and understand what does God want us to understand today about belief and, and, and unbelief. And so three points this morning. The first is this. First, there are three illustrations of unbelief, I, I believe, in this passage. There are three illustrations of unbelief. And, and I think some of us might be able to identify with one of the illustrations, two of them, maybe all three. But unbelief is something that runs rampant in all of our hearts. We're we're all there. But the first scene we see is that of the debaters. There's those that are going to be those that love to argue. Anyone here love to debate and argue? I'm just curious. I know some of you aren't raising your hand, but I know you do. You got that fight in you, right? Yeah, Rochelle, thank you. So 
there are those who like to debate. So what we don't have in Luke, what we have in other gospel accounts is, is a much fuller picture of what's happening. Matter of fact, write down Matthew 17 and, Ma- and Mark chapter 9. The beauty of having four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is that they give us this holistic picture of the life and ministry of Jesus. And as eyewitnesses, each of them kind of favors certain scenes, certain situations over others, but you take them all together and you have this full picture. Well, here's what Mark chapter 9 includes that Luke doesn't. Check these words out. So Jesus' disciples come down from the mountain. They see a great crowd and the scribes are arguing with them. Who are the scribes arguing with? The nine disciples that didn't go to the, to the top of the mountain with Jesus. And they're arguing. So can you imagine Jesus is leaving the scene of glory, right? He's connecting with the other world. He's connecting with Moses, Elijah. He takes Peter, James, and John. And what does he walk into? A bunch of fighting. As a parent, have you ever walked into a house where you're coming off a great day, you're coming off a, a peaceful drive home, and you walk in and your kids are just going at it? It happens every day in my house, but that's another story for another time. But here we go. So they walk into the scene, they're arguing, and immediately all the crowd, when they see him, were greatly amazed and ran up to greet Jesus. And here's what Jesus asks, what are you guys arguing about? What are you arguing about with them? Ladies and gentlemen, one of the things when it comes to unbelief, if you do not believe in God, you're going to have some cause you're going to argue for. If you do not believe in God, you're going to find something so important that you're going to sink your, your teeth into, you're going, to, you're going to sink your grit into, and you're going to argue, and you're, and you're going to debate, and we see it today in social media. And have, yet, have I yet to read one post that settles all debates and all arguments? Some of you are, you think your posts are going to do that. Like, oh, if I only throw this out there, the whole social media world will be at peace. Can I just tell you right now, if if God is not your satisfaction, nothing you clamor about is going to satisfy your hearts. Can I just tell you right now, argumentation is not a spiritual gift. How many of you think it's a spiritual gift? God has put me on this wall to argue, and I'm going to tell you right now that there's not going to be anyone in the kingdom of God who got there because you argue them into the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen from somebody? There was a point in my life where I used to debate with my dad and I thought, boy, I, there's a reason why I'm in my dad's life and that's to debate him into the kingdom and God just kind of said, Scott, stop. So I'm not minimizing the importance of, of, of a debate that's healthy, that's respectful, but here's what I know we don't do. Most of us don't argue with respect and gentleness. We argue because we'd rather be right than in relationship with people. And that desire to be right has become a false idol. The desire to be right has become a God. And that is a, an idol that you can continue to feed and it will never be satisfied. When God becomes the focus of your belief and you're satisfied in him, you can still have conversations with people that you may disagree with, but I'm going to tell you what, what's different about you and your, your presence in that. There's going to be grace. There's going to be kindness. There's going to be patience. As you've heard me say before, this is the PG-13 part of the service. Being an ass is not a spiritual gift. Can I get an amen? Stop! Right? There is nothing worth fighting about that you, you're going to sacrifice your testimony to how good Jesus is. And you want to know how good Jesus is? You, you, you spend time with him. And when Jesus spends time with you and you spend time with Jesus, you're going to come off with the characters of, characteristics of Jesus. And that's why he was called a friend of sinners and tax collectors. How about you? You friend of sinners and tax collectors? You guys are friend of Democrats? How many friends of Democrats out there? How many friends of Republicans out there? How many friends of anti-vaxxers out there? How many friends of unmaskers out there? You've, you love all people. Because God shows forth his love and that he sends his son to dwell with even the worst of people, which is me. Love. Quit debating, quit arguing. But there are going to be people out there who, because of unbelief, they refuse to believe God. Like the scribes, they're fighting with the disciples, right? Because I think they're trying to convince the disciples that Jesus is not the Messiah. Jesus is not God. And, and let me just tell you, find your satisfaction in God. Number two group that we see is the, is the father. So while all the, the arguing is going on, there's a voice that cries out from the crowd, a pathetic voice, a painful voice, and that is the voice of desperation. 
And all this guy wants is his son to be better. And, can, and, can, and I can't, we can't miss the, the contrast of what's happening here. Everyone is having a theological battle, perhaps about who Jesus is. And meanwhile, there's real need right there that Jesus stops and says, who is that man? What do you need to say? And he says, I don't know about debates about what's going on with the afterlife and transfiguration, all this, but all I know is I got a son at home who since the day he was born has been oppressed by de demons. And the voice of desperation calls out in the midst of all their clamoring. And I'm going to tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, per perhaps we've missed the voices of desperation in our lives today. Would, would you agree that there's people in our lives that live next door to us and we'd rather fight about whatever the fight of the day is and we're missing out hearing the pathetic, painful cries of our neighbors who just desperately need a touch of Jesus right now? All I know is that there's people going through pain and they don't, they don't, wanna, they, they don't care about the rapture. There's people in pain and they don't care about how you feel about Bill Gates. There's people in pain that still won't acknowledge that Cowboys are perhaps the greatest NFL team ever, but another story for another day. Sorry, yeah, I, I went there. Too soon, Ryan? Too soon? Okay. But do you hear what I'm saying? We've become preoccupied with the, the minor things. We've missed the major things because the major thing is this, and write this down. The only thing that is important in time and eternity are the souls of men and women. The only thing that is important Today, tomorrow, Tuesday. Here, let's just categorize this as every day that ends with the letter Y. The only thing that's important are the souls of men and women. And there's a desperate father who's crying out to have his son healed. And how have we missed those desperate voices in our lives because we think some cause is worthy of all of our time and energy and talent. Amen, church? And not only is there a desperate father, but there's a group of disciples who I would categorize as defeated. They've been doing grade A ministry work for Christ and now they come across a demon that they can't cast out. And even the man makes it public, right? As if they're arguing with the scribes of, of the, the pro-Jesus camp isn't, isn't good enough, right? This man comes up and says, hey, I brought my child who's possessed to your disciples and they could not cast the demon out. And they're like, you're not making our cause look any good, right? And I'm sure the disciples are feeling defeated. Have you ever felt defeated spiritually? Have you ever thought like, man, coming to Jesus was a great decision until I started experiencing these, these, these peaks and these valleys and, and this inconsistency. How many of you think the only consistency in your life is your inconsistency as a follower of Jesus? And how easy it is to walk away from, from times where you just feel like, man, how many times am I going to blow it? How many times am I going to fall short? And so the disciples are feeling the distress and the powerlessness of of something that Jesus at the beginning of Luke 9 verse 1 says, you will have all authority over all demons. And now they're sitting going, obviously not. Because there's one that we cannot defeat. And so they feel defeated. I wish our faith was as easy as like an on-off switch as far as belief, as far as fighting unbelief. Elon Musk, guy I really admire. I think he's a really creative, interesting guy. You guys know he's creating a Neuralink brain chip that sends waves in your brain to help you control your emotions and your attitudes. I don't think Musk is going to be able to deal with the, the line between belief and unbelief, right? As much as we would love to just kind of be taken over, right, by the Musk Neuralink, say that 10 times fast, right? Just on off. I can believe. God wants more for you and from you than just a brain chip. God wants you to be a very real active participant in what he's going to do in your, in your heart, in your soul, in your mind. So we have to adopt some, some very real practices. We have to fight some, some, some natural impulses. And so we're going to shift gears into point number two, which is this, the impotence of unbelief. 
the, the impotence of unbelief. So what I want to do here is I want to look specifically at verse 41. And, and I believe here we have what faith looks like when it's weak and what faith looks like when it's strong. And by s- all the surrounding context, I think we're going to arrive at some pretty important things. So second point, the impotence of, of, of unbelief. So Jesus comes out with this statement, verse 41. You guys see it in your Bibles? Oh, unbelieving and perverted generation. Again, here's people who want to argue. There's a guy who's desperate. There's disciples who are defeated. It doesn't sound like the right words at the right time, does it? But I think what you have here is a scene where you have the Lord who maybe is feeling a little exasperated. He's feeling a little distressed by what he sees. He just came down off this mountain and now he's in the mess. And I, and I love the fact that we have honest words from Christ's lips. I, I'm, I'm glad we have this picture of anguish and grief, right? Because he, here's the reality of it. To have a savior who's not connected with our messiness is not a savior who says things as anguishing as this. Because he sees a child who's being oppressed by demonic activity. He sees adults arguing and clamoring and and acting bad, right? And so here's Jesus entering the realm of unbelief. And I'm going to ask you a question. Does our God have the right to be mad at the unbelief that's run rampant in our world? May I remind you, he's the God who created the world. (laughs) He's the God who created you. And he has created you to be different than what sin has made of you. Because because of sin and because of humanity's fallenness, the common characteristic that every single person now shares is that of unbelief. Genesis 3. Adam and Eve walk away from God. Basically saying, God, thanks but no thanks, we got this. And immediately they plunge not only themselves but the rest of humanity into a condition we would call unbelief. Well, the reason Jesus issues this statement is because unbelief doesn't bring delight. Unbelief brings destruction. And you have a God who cares for you, who's designed you for something better. And so does he have a right to speak out against this this unbelieving and, and twisted culture? Yes! Because we settle for cheap substitutes and false gods. And, and Jesus is saying, I want something better for you. And the, the great thing about what Jesus says is that it's, that it's not really original because he's just quoting what Moses said thousands of years earlier. Deuteronomy 32, write it down. <laughs> Moses comes out before the people of Israel and says, you're an unbelieving and twisted people. Why? Because you're trying to live life without God. And one thing God is continually doing is calling us back. While this is a severe rebuke, it is not severe rejection. We we might be taken back by the fact that there's a God who rebukes us. Because I don't know anyone in this room that likes to be rebuked. But I, I perhaps think that maybe we need more rebuke. In the context of a father who says, I'm rebuking you because I love you and I'm rebuking you because you can be better and I'm rebuking you because there's something better in store when you obey me than disobey me. Here's the good news. You have a father who may re- rebuke you, but he never rejects you. Can I get an amen from somebody? I mean, because Christ doesn't like unbelieving, perverted generation, I'm out of here. That's the end of the Gospels. He doesn't do that. He sticks with his people. How many of you are grateful for the patience of God? How many of you are grateful for the long suffering that our God shows us? You know what long suffering means? He means he suffers long with us. How long do I need to be with you Jesus says, how long do I need to put up with you? I I think we need to hear Jesus say that because we've settled for things that don't grow belief, but 
it grows unbelief. And so I want to I just point out three things that I think that makes our belief weak. When is faith weak? I think we see three things in this account that I think are worthy to be talked about. And, and it's this, that number one, when we, our faith is in ourselves. Here's one thing that's not a Bible verse. You ever thought about like Bible verses that people think are Bible verses, but they're not Bible verses? Uh, like cleanliness is next to godliness. That's not a Bible verse. Just, just everyone like, oh, you know, one of those moments, right? How about this one? God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> That's not a Bible verse. Second hesitation, chapter three. No, it's not a Bible verse. It's, it's nowhere in the scripture. Um, but yet we adopt that philosophy, right? Because if we only help ourselves, if we only focus on ourselves, the, the reason we're in the trouble we're in is because we focus on ourselves. See, when your faith is weak, it's because you're not focused on God. You're focused on your own ability. You're focused on your own strength. There's a reason why the disciples couldn't cast out that demon because I believe they weren't focused on God's ability. They were focused on their own ability because of previous successes. Don't we all have a little bit of false power when we have this train of, of past successes and we can easily get our focuses off God because of what? Look what I've already done. And we can get a little bit of spiritual smugness, a little bit of spiritual pride and going, I got this. And that's the moment, like literally one week, the disciples go, Pfft. how many of you is one day you're like that? See, the disciples cannot live with a faith that's focused on themselves. Think about the father who in desperation is bringing his child to Jesus. And what does he say? He says, I've tried, the church has tried, the disciples have tried, everything else has failed, now I'm coming to you. How many of you make Jesus your last stop when it comes to your problems? And how many of you just need to stop and go, I need to make Jesus my first point of contact? Because here's what the father says literally in Mark chapter nine. Help me if you can. I mean, you hear the desperation in his voice, right? Help me if you can. I've got nowhere else to go. And that's a good thing. How many times does God need to bring us to the end of ourselves for him to show up and show us that it's his strength we need in our weakness? Second point, our faith grows weak when we focus on formulas or when our faith is in formulas. Here's what I mean by this. The disciples had had such a, a consistent train of successes that it was easy for them to put into formulas how God works. And so it came to a point where they go, hey, so we did this in this city, one, two, three, let's just keep doing that. Because it seems to be, they adopted the pragmatic approach with God and how easy it for, uh, for us to do that too. We reduce what God is doing to a set of formulas and rituals. Can I tell you, I've been involved in church ministry. I hate you to say this, but for, for a number of years, because I'm old, 30, almost 35 years. I know, since day one. I'm only 30 <laughs> something plus some years. I've planted two churches and I've worked with some great leaders and some great organizations. And you, and you know what they have out there? And I'm, and I'm not bashing the resources. But when you're given a handbook and it says, follow these easy steps and you're going to have a church of 5,000 people, here you go. And I sit there and go, this is why Christianity is, is decreasing as far as an impact and effectiveness. When I, as a church leader, of all the people that you would assume, like... Please, Scott, stay connected to the heart of God. Please, Scott, do what the, the Lord wants. Versus, I've got this book. It says, how to grow a church in three easy steps. How many of us have, have adopted that mentality? Let's just be honest. We've reduced God to a set of formulas and rituals. And if you do A, B, and C, your result is D. This is not the God of Scripture who bows to your formulas and just, you can pull him out of the box like a little circus act, right? Like, oh, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord! Da, 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 da. Okay, you're back in the box, put him away. We have placed too much confidence in our formulas and not enough 
confidence in a God who acts. And what I mean by that is this. When you believe in a God who acts, you never know when he's going to show up. You never know how he's going to show up. You never know where he's going to show up. See, if all of a sudden you've kind of just made it like, oh yeah, God's going to show up, boom, boom, boom. You have manipulated something that ought not be manipulated. I, am I making sense? Am I, are you tracking with what I'm saying? The disciples have had this formula because they just got off a whirlwind preaching tour where they had success. And now we'll just keep doing what we've been doing. And all of a sudden, bam, brick wall. Because God says, don't you dare try to manage me. I am a God who exceeds your wildest expectations. Do, do you believe that? Thirdly, we have a God who says your faith is weakened when you put your faith in success. Can I tell you how I have to wrestle? You have to wrestle with this as well. We put so much stock on results that we automatically think like God's going to give us the results we want or, you know, the formula, right? We put in all this stuff in there. Here's, here's what comes out. And I'm going to tell you right now that when you put your faith in success and you think you have God figured out, where's the role of faith in all of this? In belief. Notice what the, the disciples were confounded about. Why haven't we found success when their real cry should have been, why haven't we believed? There's a huge difference in that, in that cry. Here's what I'm thankful for. One day I'm not going to stand before God and he's going to say, well done, good and successful servant. Because God doesn't want your success. You know what God wants? Your faithfulness. I run with an interesting group of people. It's a crazy group. It's called, they're called pastors. And let me just tell you, like the biggest thing that preoccupies pastors' conversations is this. How big is your church? Thankfully, that's not going to be one, on the, uh, one of the questions on the test when we get to eternity. Okay, 50 to 100 people churches enter this door. 100 to 1,000, get through this one. Oh, and then the ones who have 10,000 plus, you guys get the big door over there, right? Like, I get mail all the time. Come to this pastor's conference, and it gives you like eight pictures of these pastors who just look all bougie and all that. They're on there. And here's the number one thing. This pastor pastors an 8,000 member church in Birmingham, Alabama. And this guy pastors a 12,000 member church in Tuba City, Arizona. And this pastor, you know, and it's all like, wow, not only do they look amazing, right? They got the high tight haircuts. They got the really cool sneakers. They've got big churches. I sit there and go, why would I want to go to this? Because I'm just that coffee shop guy. <laughs> like this, right? <laughs> Smeagol. <laughs> precious. Ah, if I only had the, that church over there, right? Like I gave up on that so long ago. Not that ch big churches are bad, but here's what's bad about big churches is that sometimes they come across as if if you're not at where they're at, you are not successful. The moment a church leader starts talking about numbers is the moment I, I divert the conversation or walk away from the conversation. What doesn't matter in the kingdom is the size of your church. What matters in the kingdom is the size of your heart. That's faithfulness. That's faithfulness. The moment I start focusing on results and outcomes, and numbers, and money, and buildings, ABCs, attendance buildings. The moment your focus is on the ABCs, the moment your faith just shrivels. I don't know how God acts. All I know is I want to stay connected to the God, the heart of a God who acts. And he's present, and he's present right here, right now. And I'm grateful for that. To hear God say, well done, good, and faithful. Sir, oh boy.
That's going to be music to my ears. Because there's one thing I can't control, and that's success. But the one thing I can control is faithfulness to God. I'm going to go, do that and twice on Sundays. Amen? But how about when faith is strong? What does it look like? We've already looked at three kind of th points that I think will only weaken our faith and, and shrivel our faith. What about things that will help our faith grow strong? There's two of them. The first one is this when it's in relationship with God. You've already probably heard me say this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it again in a different way. While we don't want to resort to formulas and rituals, what we have to understand is that God does not want us to maintain relationship with him through rituals. He wants us to maintain relationship with him through relationship. That nothing matters more to the heart of God than just to, to be connected with you. He, he doesn't base his relationship on your performance. He doesn't base his relationship on your successes. He bases his relationship on, with you on a covenant commitment that he's going to be your daddy. He's going to be your father. He's going to be your Lord. He's going to be your God. He's gonna, never going to leave you or forsake you. He's going to walk, walk with you through not only the mountaintops, but he's going to walk with you through the valleys. That he's going to be the God who's your shepherd and he's going to lead you with his voice and he's going, to, he's going to resource you with his power because he never calls you to do something without giving you the power to live that way. John chapter 15, write this verse down, tattoo it to your brains on your foreheads. When you look at the mirror every morning, right? Like maybe go out and do that. I don't know, next week if you come back, like look, Scott, I got a tattoo on my forehead. Make it be this, okay? John 15, 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is it that bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. That is reaping relationship right there. Right? What's the key idea? Abiding. Spending time with your God, listening to his voice, understanding his heart. Nothing matters more for you than to walk with a God who wants to walk with you. He doesn't just say, hey, Sunday morning, 1045, meet me there. He saying at 5 a.m. Monday morning, 7 p.m. Tuesday night, I'm with you and I want to abide with you. And if you abide in me, you need to know something. You're going to produce something. And that production of something is going to bring me glory. And the moment you divorce yourself from me, the moment you deny the relationship that is so vital to this relationship is the re re when you come to the reality that apart from me, you can do nothing. You know what nothing means there, literally? No thing. I mean, it takes a seminary degree to figure all this stuff out, right? What can you do apart from relationship with God? Nothing. Why are we desperate? Because we try to do things apart from relationship. Why are we defeated? Because we try to do things apart from relationship. Why do we resort to social media and think that one post is going to solve all the ills of, Ills of the world? Because we don't have relationship with God. Faith will never go beyond the promises of God. Let me say that another way. Whatever goes beyond the confines of God's word is no longer faith. And what have we bought into even within Christian circles that we think is the voice of God and it's not? There are voices out there, men and women, and I can name names, and I just may. I mean, Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, Sarah, what's her name? Jesus Calling. Yeah, all have gone beyond the confines of God's word, and they're making false assurances and promises to you, the church that you've bought into, and you're wondering why you're desperate and defeated. There's no substitute for the word of God. Can I get an amen from somebody? And God will not foster a relationship with you outside his revealed word of God. Can I get an amen from somebody? This is why we, are, we try to be saturated in the word, right? I'm not up here going, well, this is what Deepak Chopra said the other day, and oh, look at Oprah Winfrey has to offer. And then, you know, your best life now with Mr. Osteen, check that. And like, my wife was laughing last week because at the end of the message, I said, I just want to give you guys a couple verses, and I ended up giving you like eight like chunks of scripture. And you know what? I didn't feel bad about that. Why? Because I'm a pastor that wants to direct you not to my wisdom, but to God's wisdom. 
I'm a pastor that wants you saturated with the, the heart and mind of God and the riches he's given us in his word and not settle for cheap substitutes outside of his word. And my wife brought it up to me. I said, okay. <laughs> like if I'm guilty, like oh, that pastor, there's just too much scripture in his messages. Wow, if that's all that's got to be said about me. I'm doing okay. I can think of worse things. Have a relationship. This is why Jesus in Matthew 17, look at this, and, and, I, and I want you to think about this. He says, because of your little faith, faith is little when there's no relationship with God. Faith is enlarged when it's in relationship with God. And I love the fact that Jesus puts the blame for everything that's going on on their shoulders. Don't, you, don't we all have a tendency to want to blame God? And in reality, sometimes God just says, no, it's on you. And why? He says, because if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed. Has anyone ever heard the mustard seed before? Because if you have, I'm about ready to dash everything you've heard about the mustard seed. But in a good way. Jesus brings up the mustard seed not so that you can focus on the mustard seed. He brings up the mustard seed so you can focus on a greater object than the mustard seed. Because what's the mustard seed? All of us have heard, smallest seed in the world. But that's not Jesus' point. Because he's saying if you have mustard seed faith, right, you can move here, there, and you know, nothing will be impossible for you. And we're all like, yes! Here's what Jesus' concern is. How big is the God who's given you the mustard seed? How big is the God who's created you? Because in the context of a big God, you can have the smallest of faith and watch out if your focus is in the right place. The reason the mustard seed is given to us is not that we go, okay, oh, God, here's my little crumb of trust or belief. No, no, no. God is not concerned about the outcome. He is concerned about the object of your affection. And mustard seed faith thrives when there's a God who is large and in charge. Right? Which means there's a God so beyond our wildest comprehension that even when we utter words that maybe have a tinge of belief connected to them, we're trusting not in the outcome of what our faith can produce, but we're trusting in the object of who's even given us faith to begin with. Woo! How big is your God? Because if I'm really testing what I'm describing to us this morning in the context of our culture, you Christians worship a pretty small God. The God you say you worship is a God that is pretty worthless. You know how I say that? Look at how we're clamoring over things that are not the glory of God, over things that are not the gospel of Christ, over things that are not the kingdom, over the things that don't impact the souls of men and women. We want power. We want pride. We want praise. But you know what? We don't want to be humbled and to serve and to be weak so that God's strength shows up and he is shown to be awesome. I hate to be that guy. Because some of you are sitting there judging me already like, oh, you're not a pastor who loves our country, baloney. You're not a pastor who prays for our government, baloney. But you know what I love more than the US of A and more than the president? Jesus. Drop mic. <laughs> Point number two, and I'm going to make the connection here. It's not just relationship, it's reliance on God. And you know how Jesus spells this out? What is reliance on God? Prayer. Because he makes the connection with the disciples because they come to him in secret. Notice what is said in uh, verses 7, uh, 20 and 21 in Matthew 17. Or, oh yeah, Mark 9. They enter the house. Jesus, like, they pull Jesus aside privately. And I love this. Like, we're already feeling defeated. Please don't address our, our, our insecurities and our, and our insufficiencies in front of the crowd. So they steal away with Jesus and they ask him privately, why can't we cast this demon out? Jesus says to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. 
you try to do an incredible spiritual act without first doing the most incredible spiritual act, and that's what? Praying. Christians in America want power, but they don't want to pray. And you want to know how I can make that statement? Because when you fight and debate and argue and clamor and want power, that is not the result of a spirit-led, spirit-driven life. Prayer produces humble, gracious, patient, kind, compassionate people. Like that one woman that was interviewed the other day and I forgot the context, but it had something to do with, oh, you know what, we need to keep this country Christian and we need to keep Trump in the light blah, 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 because that's God's will for America. I sit there and go, no, this, please silence. Stop. And everyone's like praising her. And I'm like, no, we need to be people of prayer and to be able to disagree with people without being disagreeable. You can disagree without being disagreeable. But write, write that down. I'm not charging extra. Second service only content right there. I'm all for supporting a government that wants to fall in line with what God wants. Right? So don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying I'm pro-Trump. I'm not saying I'm anti-Trump. I think it's important to be involved in the world of politics. But the manner in which we posture ourselves in our culture has lo a lot to be desired. We're fighting for power, but how are you fighting for prayer? Because when you fight for prayer, you become a different presence in a culture that is dying all around us. So what if you get the power and you don't have prayer? What have you accomplished? You've gained the whole world and yet lost your soul. Do you guys hear what I'm saying? Prayerfulness produces dependency. Prayerfulness is that, is that conversation with God where, God, we don't understand. We, we, we want to believe, but we're also unbelieving, so help us in our unbelief. That's what the father of the child says in another context. <laughs> help my unbelief. How many of you pray to God, help my unbelief? Because right now we're having a tough time seeing through all the, the garbage that's, that's around us. If we become prayerful people, you become confident people. And your confidence is not based upon political outcomes. Your confidence is in a God who says, I got this and more. I've got you. Prayerfulness produces confidence. It produces hopefulness. It produces a people who are going to say, I'm going to give up control. I'm going to give up confidence in myself and I'm going to look to Christ. Because it's your will be done. Not mine, your will. Father. And so, John 15, 7. Again, second verse of tattoo. Maybe there's room on your chin for this tattoo. I don't know. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. Pray. If there's relationship then you can come to God with confidence and ask whatever you wish and it's going to be done for you. Relationship and reliance work hand in hand. Pray. Pray. Quit trying to go about doing God's work without praying. Quit trying to go about God's work without that dependency upon him because honestly, prayer reminds us that that there's a transparency and vulnerability about our lives that God adores. Because this is not about your glory and your strength. This is about his glory and his strength and your weakness. Pray. If I came before you and said I had no organic relationship with my wife or my kids, but yet everything in my home is just fine, you guys would say, liar. If, if my wife and I, if I didn't seize upon the fact that, you know, you and I are going out. We went to Sicilian Butcher the other night. Anyone ever been to the Sicilian Butcher? Listen, I'm a pastor, but I also get gift cards, just FYI, all right? So we went to Sicilian Butcher, just her and I, and why? Just a chance to connect. 
Because why, my wife needs to know that sometimes we need to leave our house, we need to leave our kids, we need to leave our neighborhood, we need to leave our coffee shop, we need to leave our church, and we need to be together because why? This is the most important relationship there is outside of my relationship with God. How do you think God is saying to you right now, like, hey, can we have a date night together? Can we go get some wine and some bruschetta and hang out? That's the best kind of God, to hang out with wine and bruschetta. But hear the heart of your God saying, I want to spend time with you. And I want to talk with you and I want you to talk to me and I want there to be an organic, vital, real relationship between us. Because what matters at the end is not every single one of your prayers being answered, but your God being a faithful, covenant, committed partner to you. Think about that. You're less concerned about prayers being answered and you're more concerned about a, a, a vital, real relationship with God because no matter what happens, what the outcome is, it doesn't matter because you have God. Woo! Last point is this. Two brief instructions for you to fight to destroy unbelief, right? Some instruction against unbelief. So Jesus, he says this searing statement in verse 41, right? Then he says, bring your son to me. Jesus heals the son and everyone in the crowd is marveling over the miracle. And then Jesus leans into his disciples and says, hey, don't forget I'm going to the cross. <laughs> it's all, I love it, right? Like all these people are like, the son is healed. The son is healed. And Jesus says to his disciples, hey, don't forget I'm going to die in a few days. He's keeping it in perspective. Belief doesn't happen through astonishment. Belief happens because of accomplishment. You're not saved because you're marveling at God's miracles. You are saved because you believe in God's greatest miracle, and that's the accomplishment of Christ being victorious over the death of death, grave, and sin. Stop believing in, in astonishing and start believing in what has already been accomplished. Amen. It is finished. Jesus. Hey, don't forget. I, I'm going to die in a few days. And they're confused. But what is Jesus saying? He's saying it to us today. Things are going to happen every single day. Things that you would expect and things you wouldn't expect. Things that you can control and things you can't control. Things that you've been praying for that haven't been answered and things you've been praying for that have been answered. But in the big scheme of things, what is the instruction for our hearts? It's number one, reliance on Jesus' power and ability. Cross-focused, cross-centered, cross-obsessed. The moment you steer away from what Christ has accomplished, it will begin to diminish your faith. You will grow in unbelief. That's why Jesus says, take communion. Remember the cross, right? The path to glory is a path that goes through suffering first. The path to the crown is first that path goes through the cross before you get to the crown. Which means secondly, too, I need to do something within my own heart, and that's this. I need to reject my confidence and my control. I need to constantly reject every time I try to step in and do things without God's help. I am not wise in my own estimation. I do not bring wisdom to guide my, my steps in the journey we call life. I am desperate for God. Because without God, if I put my hope and my confidence in my own control, that's going to be messed up in an hour from now. But if my confidence is Christ's confidence and, and I give up control and let him take the, the levers of the universe, guess what? That's the right place where my heart needs to be. Is your God big enough to handle what's going on in your life? Is your God big enough to handle the things going on in our community and our culture? Is your God big enough to handle the things going on with our country and our, and our world? Yeah. Stay connected to him. Stay connected to his heart because there's no safer place to be than near the heart of your heavenly father. And all God's people said, Amen. next week we're going to talk about who's the greatest in the church. Yay, can't wait for that one. All right, so let's stand, let's pray. Father, thanks for today. Thanks for loving us. Thank you for these men and women. Lord, get a hold of our hearts. Lord, help us be in that place where, 
where we're in proper alignment, Lord. Forgive us for the ways we, we, have, we have followed other voices and we followed other plans. And Lord, today has been a call back to Christ, a call back to the word, a call back to pray. Help us be the people that honor you, not with our, our, our lips, but with our hearts. Help, help us be people who don't fight for power, but fight to be prayer, prayerful in everything we do. Thanks for loving us unconditionally. Thanks for loving us with such grace and mercy and compassion. May everything we do and say be for your glory, O oh God. And we can only pray this in Jesus, our Savior. Amen.